r slash no sleep posted by you slash harambe underscore 556 don't ever visit the black forest part one i don't know where to begin but then again it might not matter because i don't suppose any of you will believe me and from the looks of things i won't be around to find out how my tale is received anyway i'm a travel journalist currently based in munich though originally from the uk when i first moved to munich I planned to stay there for a few months, trying to secure positions with some European newspapers, but the well-paying journalism position which I secured meant that I ended up staying there for a few years, buying a studio flat near the city center. I had a lot of German friends in the city, so, although I didn't speak German myself, well, very, very basic German, I was able to get by without feeling isolated or lonely. Now, I was used to the editor's office sending me overseas, Australia, Japan, Mexico, I love to escape the normality of Europe. So when they told me they were keeping me in Germany, just sending me west a little, I couldn't help but feel disappointed. I asked where I was going, they said they wanted an article on the Black Forest, Schwarzwald. Named after the dense darkness created by its pine trees, the Black Forest is an alpine mountain range in southwestern Germany. Stretching west into the Rhine River and south into the foothills of the Alps, it is the largest nature preserve in the country. But, my boss told me, the true angle they wanted me to work wasn't just the natural beauty, it was the haunting atmosphere. The forest is something of a supernatural spot in Germany, the setting for many ghost stories and grim tales. They wanted an article analyzing the gothic mood of the place, which they could print in time for Halloween. My initial disappointment about the assignment gave way to intrigue, I was always a bit of a horror nut, and visiting a creepy spot like this was just my kind of thing. As the trip grew closer, I became more and more excited doing my own research on the folklore behind the forest, and the amazing natural vistas which could be surveyed there. I was flown to Baden-Baden, one of the largest towns within the forest. Although my hotel was five-star, gourmet restaurant, pool, and spa, I honestly didn't really like the town. It was swarming with tourists, and the whole place had a very commercial air, I was eager to reach the authentic heart of the Black Forest. Next, I rented a car for my two-hour drive, one eye on the wheel, one out the window, taking in the gorgeous scenery, to the tiny village of Gudak. Here, I could see a true traditional lifestyle on display, a heavily agricultural, almost medieval lair. Almost directly in the forest center, only here did I realize how refreshing it was to get away from the city. Still, an agitating little voice at the back of my mind piped up, there is nobody around for hundreds of miles, no cell service, no police, nothing to help you if something goes wrong. And, as it turned out, something did. The final stage of my journey was another, slightly shorter drive, this one to my final destination. I had to be careful, navigating these roads, they weren't paved at all, covered in thick snow or layers of ice, and more often than not they ran alongside dizzyingly high ravines. For the first 45 minutes, I would see the occasional cabin or simple cottage in the valleys below me, even a large ski resort, once. It amazed me that people were willing to take such extensive measures for a little peace and quiet on their holiday. The area, although isolated, was a pretty popular hiking route, and a few hospitality businesses had jumped onto the untapped gold mine of weary travelers. But eventually, I began to see no more buildings, just trees, huge pines, clustered and peering into my car. I noticed almost instantly that the forest deserved its name, in the most densely populated areas, a sort of artificial night was created by the branches. That unshakable feeling of being completely alone was a strong one now, I shoved it to the back of my mind and I had arrived. I rounded a corner, and there it was. The cabin lay in the center of a large clearing, covered in a carpet of crisp white snow. It was as if, for a moment, the pine trees had subsided from their relentless attack, and had left just a small circle of peaceful space. It was beautiful. The frost glittered in the winter sun, and behind the cabin roof, three mountain crags sprawled across the sky. The cabin itself was wonderfully quaint, walls made of whole pine logs, in the traditional style of the region two floors, with a patio surrounding it, and a simple thatched roof. I parked my car next to the house, and unlocked the front door. Before even getting my luggage out, I ran through the cabin like a small child, giddy with excitement. The interior was as pretty as the exterior, hand-carved furniture, a wood fire, cozy little rooms. A lounge, a small kitchen, a supply closet, upstairs, two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a study. All through the building was the thick smell of pine. I began to unpack, and it took a few hours. 
I was planning to be there for two months, with drives back up to Gudok every two weeks for necessities. I had brought every kind of tool I might possibly need, for any circumstance, plus a spare for each. I had even purchased two extra tires to go with my car, which I rolled, after some effort, out of the trunk. By the time I had finished unpacking, the sun had begun to set. I wasn't going to start work on the article on the first day, in fact, I planned to spend the first three or four days relaxing and taking in the overall atmosphere, before I started any work. There was no service here, and no television, so I had to content myself with reading a book by firelight on that first evening. You've never experienced true darkness unless you have seen nighttime in a wild place, no lamps outside, no street lights, nothing but the faraway moon to illuminate the clearing around the cabin. I dozed off on the couch, staring at that waxy moon through the window. I awoke in the mid-morning. After cooking myself breakfast on the gas stove, I got dressed into my heavy winter gear. I would take a long walk, bringing lunch with me, before returning in the late afternoon. I had been warned not to stay out after dark. As I stepped outside, I was hit by something strange, there was no birdsong. During my preparatory research, I had learned about several species of bird common in the black forest, and yet, not the slightest chirp. I found the silence unsettling, I hummed to myself to keep it away. As I broke the tree line which ringed the clearing, and continued onwards, I watched over my shoulder as the sun's bright light grew smaller and smaller, the miniature cabin framed in front of it. Of course, that's not to say that it was pitch black among the pines, but there was a discernible dimness. I trotted onwards eagerly. I had hoped to spot a fox or some deer, maybe even a lynx, the funnel was one of the main focuses of my visit. But I didn't see a single sign of animal life, not even a startled grouse or a darting shrew. There weren't even any insects for me to hear, no buzzing of ticks or humming of crickets. But I did not let myself get too disturbed by this, after all, I was traipsing around pretty loudly, probably scaring away most things. And the flora left nothing to be desired, blood-red berry bushes and rich green ferns were enough for my eyes to feast on. Despite the oddities about my surroundings, it really was great to be in the middle of such pure natural wonder. I stopped for lunch, resting on a fallen log, then continued. I kept checking my watch, first every so often, but slowly more frequently, counting down to the time when I would have to turn around. In fact, it was just as I was turning to make my way back when I saw it. Something black, poking out from a snowdrift slightly downhill from me. I struggled forward, curiosity getting the better of me, careful not to tumble amidst the large pile of loose snow. As I got closer, I could make out what my peculiar sighting was. A pair of hiking boots, nothing else. Just two adult hiking boots, one left foot, one right foot. Spaced a few centimeters apart. Upright, like an invisible person was standing in them. A chill washed over me. There was something very wrong about this. For starters, what hiker would have just left their boots in the snow? I couldn't see any realistic circumstance in which someone would feel no other choice but to abandon their hiking boots in the forest. And secondly, even if they had a good reason, they were in mortal danger, wandering around with only a few hours of daylight left on a frozen mountain, without boots. I racked my brains for any possible explanation for this. I hadn't seen or heard another living soul during my walk. And besides, there were no footprints in the snow around me apart from my own, these boots had been here for at least a day. I calmed myself, trying to rationalize the situation. There was no real way of telling how old these boots were, how long they had sat here, however they got to be here, it wasn't my problem. Quashing my sense of unease, I turned away and headed home. The next morning, I repeated the same routine, although this time, I walked in a different direction than I had the day before. Wandering through the towering pines, there were once again no signs of animal life, but I was still able to tap into the same peaceful feeling which the forest seemed to ooze. Then it happened again. I did a double take, brain frantically trying to assign meaning to the blurry shape which my eyes had glanced over. Another pair of boots. For a split second, I thought that I might have somehow walked in a circle and come back to the same spot as yesterday, that was how strong the eerie sense of deja vu was. But no, they were clearly different boots, a different brand. These ones were sitting, half hidden, just behind a holly bush, same position and condition as the first. Now, the creeping apprehension of the first encounter had become real bewilderment. What earthly reason could there be for these abandoned hiking boots, in the middle of an abandoned forest trail? But I didn't feel threatened exactly, not yet anyway. It seems stupid now, but I pressed on. The fear flared up again when I saw the third pair, even more at the fourth. 
but as the fifth and sixth passed by, I began to calm down, the tension lessening. I learned to spot them, it became a kind of habit, as I walked. Sometimes, I would see them in groups of twos or threes, each pair spaced a few meters apart from each other. Overall, I must have found at least 50 pairs of boots, scattered across the mountain. The scale of it somehow made it easier to take in. Surely, there was no way that this could be anything but a very elaborate, very bizarre joke. The last ones I found were the worst. Four pairs, standing below a small outcrop. Two adults, and two children. From the size of them, the owners couldn't have been more than five years old. Seeing those tiny children's Wellington boots sitting there made my blood run cold like again, like it had the very first time. All of a sudden I became all too aware of the howling winter wind, and I shuddered as I gazed at this family of footwear. I lifted my head from them, longing for my fireplace and my book, then I caught sight of the tree. It was by far the largest pine I had come across on my travels through the black forest, and that was saying a lot, it was closer in size to a man-made tower than to a tree. For a moment, I forgot about my disturbing finds, totally in awe. Quickly, I raised my camera and took a few snapshots. I drew closer, and the tree completely dwarfed me. Staring upwards, my eyes became lost in a kaleidoscope of branches. The bark was very weathered, clearly this was an ancient thing. But, as I inspected, I realized that there were scratches and cuts made in its surface, deliberate markings, though I could not discern any words from them. I circled around the great trunk, yes, there were clear notches in the bark, and here and there small shapes drawn, almost like runes. On closer inspection, I could pick out objects hanging in the branches above me, little tokens, trinkets, ornaments even, hard to make out, hanging from the twigs. In fact, when I listened carefully, I could hear the sound of chimes in the wind. Clearly, this was some kind of cultural spot, known to either the locals or the passing hikers. It was a perfect centerpiece for my article, I took more snapshots of the tree and the symbols engraved on it. Suddenly, I was staring at a much larger piece of engravement. There were words etched into the wood, scrawled in large print. I could easily recognize it as modern German. But with my very limited conversational grasp of the language, there was no way for me to decipher it. I took several pictures of the etching, hoping to translate it at a later date. Der Fleischweber kommt. Du kannst ihm nicht entkommen. Der große Schaden kommt. Er wird die Kommentat betteln lassen. Encircling the writing completely was a ring, made up of strange symbols, three interlocking triangles, woven together. I zoomed in on just one of these planning to research the symbol when I actually had an internet connection. Furthermore, I noticed that, a little to the left of me, the ground in front of the tree had ruptured and split, gigantic roots bursting upwards through snow and dirt. Between these roots there were several large holes, varying in size from a bucket to a rabbit burrow. I wondered if any animals did live inside these, I doubted it, given my lack of zoological sightings so far. I stopped at each small pit, peering in, examining the contents. When I came to the final hole, I stopped. This one was different from the rest, much larger. It looked almost like the entrance to a cave, it was deep enough that I could not see the bottom. The hole was very, very dark, a pot of thick black ink. It was so dark that it seemed like the darkness leached out of it and spread across the snow, a little or a shadow around the mouth in the ground. The more I stared into that hole, the less I liked it. I can't explain what it was about it, but it frightened me more than the silence, or the missing animals, or the boots. I think it was because, as I looked at the hole, I felt as if the hole was looking back at me. I felt as if a voice was calling up from the blackness, inviting me to come down. I turned sharply and hurried away, back towards the cabin. I was paranoid all through the long trek back, every so often checking over my shoulder, sure that I would see something. But I reached the house without incident. Quickly, I locked the door, and went to warm up by the fireplace. That night, I was anxious and restless tossing over all that I had experienced in my head. Even before the hole, the forest had had an unsettling atmosphere, and, although I might have been able to ignore it before, I couldn't now. And the boots, I would have alerted the authorities, but couldn't with no service and no police stations for hundreds of miles. Wasn't it strange that I could find so many pairs of abandoned hiking boots, yet not come across a single hiker? I decided that I would stick it out for a few more days, the newspaper was paying very well, after all, but any more creepy occurrences and I was legging it out of there. Something was very, very wrong with the place. At some point during the night, I awoke to a knock at the door. First, I had thought it was an imagining of my half-asleep mind. But as it persisted, I was jolted to attention by a sudden, electric burst of fear. 
who the fuck was knocking on the door of my cabin, in the very deepest, least inhabited part of the black forest, at 2 am. I began to hyperventilate. I didn't want to go down those stairs, didn't want to open the door. But I knew that if I didn't face what was there, my fear would only grow as my imagination filled in the blanks. As quietly as I could, I creeped over to the window of my bedroom, from which there was a view of the front door. I could see a human figure, that, at the very least, was a relief to my hysterical mind. After taking a few deep breaths, I forced myself to walk down the stairs, every step taken in slow motion. I think I slipped into tunnel vision for a moment as I approached the front door. I undid the latch, but something told me to keep the chain on. I opened the door a crack, stealing myself to meet the late night visitor. I couldn't help but let out a gasp of horror. The first thing that hit me was his size. The man in front of me had to be at least eight, if not nine feet tall, I couldn't believe that there was a human alive this large. He looked unkept, clothes in tatters, skin covered with a layer of frost, and yet he did not shiver, or look the slightest bit affected by the bitter cold. His hair was long, down past his shoulders, matted and greasy and black as the night. I come to his face last because it was the worst part about him. His face was pale, horribly pale, in contrast to his dark hair, clothing, and background, it gave the eerie effect of a disembodied head, floating in the air above me. Due to his freakish height, he had to bend his neck to even look me in the eyes. He had on a grotesque smile, I find the impression it gave difficult to describe. It was almost dopey, almost half asleep, he looked like he was higher in a trance. He leered down at me with a childish, absent-minded aspect, like a toddler, but do not for one second think that his gaze came across as innocent. He stared at me like an infant stares with mild curiosity a woodlouse before he tears off its legs and squishes it between his fingers. And God, his eyes. They were glazed, glossy, lolling lazily in their sockets. The most unnerving thing about them was the color, or lack of, even. They had no color, that is, I could find no color in them, but they weren't black, they weren't colorless, they weren't clear. I can't explain it, it's not something a human mind can explain. All I know is that those eyes made my head swim when I stared into them. We stood face to face, or, more accurately, chest to face, for what felt like an eternity. The man said nothing, he just continued to grin at me. All I could hear was my heart pounding thunderously in my chest. My brain was overwhelmed by the thousand questions that it had, all fighting for space at once. I couldn't tear away from those eyes. Suddenly, I tried to slam the door shut. Bang! His hand caught the door a millisecond before it closed, expression unchanging, never looking away from me. His hand was big, it had to be, with his size, but what truly shocked me was his fingers. They were each longer than the length of his palm, almost as if someone had taken claws and made them into flesh. He pushed the door back open, a little wider this time. Still, we just stood there. I was acutely aware of every minor detail, the distant moaning of the wind, my rapid breaths, his labored rasping. And still, he stared with that same awful look. God, why didn't he move? But I knew something he didn't know, the keys which I kept on the table by the door. Slowly, careful not to let the parts of my body visible move, I reached out for them. Nearly, nearly, yes. I felt the cold metal in my hand. Now I repeated the slow, discreet action, withdrawing the arm. I poised myself, knowing I would only get one's chance to strike. Quick as a flash. I jammed the key as hard as I could into his belly, stumbling backwards as I yanked it out. He didn't even cry out, but his stare dropped for a second as he instinctively let his guard down, clutching the bloody gash. In a whirlwind of explosive movement, I hurled myself at the door, slamming it shut with enough force that I thought it might shatter. I locked it, and collapsed onto the floor behind me, shaking, clutching the key as some sort of futile attempt at a weapon. At any moment I was expecting the door to burst back open to see that horrible smile poke through the cracks, but after half an hour, nothing had happened. Eventually, I plucked up the courage to crawl over to the window, looking out, I could see the man, a fair way across the clearing, back to me, walking away into the night. Of course, I didn't sleep any more that night. My trip had gone from a frightening feeling to a possibly life-threatening situation. But I've always prided myself on being good in these kinds of moments, that's not to say I don't get scared. I've just always been able to think rationally under pressure. Sure, I could pack my bags and drive as far away as possible as soon as I could. But, packing would take a while, call me stupid but I wasn't going to abandon my stuff in that godforsaken place, and by the time I was ready to leave I would have to drive through the night, 
out of the question in that kind of terrain. Given that I was going to have to wait until tomorrow morning before I could leave anyway, the journalist in me argued that I might as well devote my time to a worthwhile goal, getting some evidence for what was going on here, 